add. Uh, it seems like in English they'd be the trickiest of all the trig functions, but in this case hyperbolic is hyperbola, not uh, the most, the superlative. So we're going to start really fast review. Uh, the regular trig functions are all based on the circle, and they have the uh, cos x is sine y, or cosine is x, sine is y, and you have the x squared plus y squared equals 1 relationship. So they all have this relationship right here. The hyperbola that we're going to use look like this. The difference is it is x squared minus y squared equals 1. So that's what we're going to use. And a point on here, we're going to use u as the input instead of theta because we're not talking about a circle or rotations anymore. So we don't, really, we want to, we don't want to reuse the uh, theta. So we have x, y is cos. Now, uh-oh, should be cos undo. There we go. So it goes hyperbolic is cos h. So the function is cosine with an h at the end. And the input is going to be u. And then the sine function is sine with an h on the end, u. So our trig functions have an h at the end. So these are all hyperbolic trig functions. So this is old trig. And new trig is hyperbolic. And this is, of course, 1.7. So it's hyperbolic trig. All the trig functions have an h at the end. What's the section for hyperbolic trig? Oh, it's not 1.7. It's 7.7. 7. Okay. There we go. Yeah, 7.7. Because 7, 7.6 was the inverse trig. All right, so in a very similar way to the inverse trig, our goal was to get derivatives and antiderivatives. Our goal here is pretty much just to get some antiderivative forms. So we're going to do end up getting hyperbolic inverse trig antiderivatives. So we just went through all the inverse trig antiderivatives. So like 1 over 1 plus x squared integral is tangent inverse. So we're going to have ones that look pretty similar. They're going to have squares and fractions. And some of them, I think, have square roots. And we're just going to get different forms. So it's just going to give us uh, some new forms that we can integrate. So our functions now, it's cos h is the function, and then u is the input. And sine h is the function, u is the input. Uh, this right here, these two points have an x-coordinate of 1 and negative 1. So this won't really come into play, but you can't have x smaller than um, What is wrong with this? And my notes to say x greater than 0. You can't get 0. This won't really matter that much. I'm worried the inequality doesn't match the graph. All right. That won't really come into play. So here is one way to. Uh, define them, but then how in the world does u relate to uh, the actual uh, how can you take a u, a number u, and then get out an output? And one definition, the one we're going to use is sine h of x equals the fraction e to the x minus e to the minus x divided by 2. So that's hyperbolic sine. Hyperbolic cosine is similar, except there's a plus. So it's e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2.
So we'll start out with a couple identities. Here's the first one. So we're going to have 2 sine h, 2, and you can pronounce it either sine h or cinch and cosh, but I'll probably just say sine h and cos h. So 2 sine h, x, cos h, x. So we're going to figure out a way to write this as a different form. So let's go ahead and write out what is sine h and cos h. So in sine h, we have e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. And cos h is e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2. All right. Fractions definitely suck. So let's get collect all the twos and the halves together. So we got a times two divided by two divided by two. So there's just divided by two overall. So I'm going to write it as one half times e to the x minus e to the minus x times e to the x plus e to the minus x. All right, so that was some pretty easy algebra to see right there. Nothing fancy. I could foil these out. However, I can also be lazy and not foil them out. What do we call this particular product? Why can I foil it super fast? Difference of squares or conjugates. All right, it's a minus b times a plus b. So you can call it either way. So I'm really quickly going to multiply it. We have e to the x squared minus e to the minus x squared. So there's our product, a squared minus b squared. Now I'm going to rewrite this. This is e to the x to the squared. So e to the 2x. So that is powers of powers of products. So this is e to the 2x, and the other one is e to the negative 2x. So we've got e to the 2x minus e to the minus 2x. And then I'm going to write the half all down below. How can I rewrite this in terms of one of the original? It looks a whole lot like <coughs> sine h. How can I write this as sine h of something? What something can I feed sine h to get this? So this is sine h of 2x. So what's the difference? The x's just became 2x. So this is sine h of 2x. So here is a double angle formula right off the bat. You won't really need any of the identities that we get aside from the antiderivatives we do at the very end. So that's the only thing you really need in your notes. And I'll hopefully remember to say that at the end. So there's one identity right there. Uh, let's do. So you don't want to put these on your cheat sheets? You, you won't need to put these on your cheat sheets. The only thing you'll need is like the last, when we get the antiderivatives at the end. There'll be, I think, three forms that we get that are similar but a little different to the inverse trig antiderivatives that we just got. All right. Tangent, hyperbolic tangent. What would be a reasonable thing to call hyperbolic tangent? Yep, hyperbolic sine over hyperbolic cosine. So that's what tangent is, hyperbolic tangent sine hx over cos hx, so no surprise there. Cotangent is a reciprocal. So cot h x cos hx over sine hx. All right. How about hyperbolic cosecant? One over sine, hyperbolic sine. So as long as everything's hyperbolic, it's pretty much the 
way you would normally define all these right here. So this is 1 over sine hx and seek hx 1 over cos hx. All right, so there should be no surprise right there. Just basically add an h. Uh, some of the double angle formulas are exactly the same. Like some of these identities are exactly the same. Some of them off. You're going to find out a lot of them are off by a negative sign is pretty much how they differ. Uh, so they're, that's one of the main reasons they call these uh, hyperbolic trig functions. They have a lot of really super similar relations to the regular trigs. All right, let's go with cos h2x. So we'll start with cos h 2x, and I'm going to just take cos h, which is the one with the plus in it, right up there. So it's e to the x plus e to the negative, well, e to the 2x plus e to the negative 2x over 2. And we're going to look at what would we get if we tried to make a Pythagorean identity right here. So if we took, so separately, cos hx, cos h squared x plus sine h squared x. We would expect this to be 1 in regular trig. So this is not the regular relationship where if we subtract them, we get 1 somewhere up here. Subtract the squares, we get 1. So let's go ahead and square these, see what we get. So cos is e to the x minus e to minus x. No, plus. Uh, plus sine is e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. We're squaring them, adding them together. So we get over 4. And when we FOIL the top, we have e to the 2x plus 2 plus e to the negative 2x. Did I do that right? Yes. Why is my inside-outside term the number 2? What's e to the x times e to the negative x? So this is e to the x minus x, which is e to the 1. No, 0, which is 1. All right. So that's why you multiply e to the x, e to the minus x. They're going to cancel. Um, you probably will see this a few more times as we go. All right, so that turned into a 2, that middle term. Now we do the same thing with the, uh, we're foiling the ones with negative in the middle. We're going to get e to the 2x, which is e to the x squared. We saw that minus 2, that's the outside inside, and then plus e to the minus 2x over 4. All right, we have 2 fourths minus 2 fourths. So our 2's are going to cancel each other out. 2 cancels the 2. And we have e to the 2x over 4 plus e to the 2x over 4. So we have 2 e to the 2x over 4. And we have plus e to the negative 2x plus e to the negative 2x, 2e to the negative 2x. All right, so whenever I do something tricky in algebra, I'm going to try to explain it, or try to remember to explain it. And then when I do things that are less tricky, like collecting <coughs> similar terms, adding up two things, I'll just do it. All right. Here, factor out 2, cancel a half. So we're going to get, instead of a fourth, we'll have a half on the bottom. Over 2, e to the 2x plus e to the negative 2x. So just factor out 2, cancel it with the denominator. And this should be something cos h2x. So there is our 
other identity, which is cos h squared x plus sine h squared x equals cos h of 2x. All right, so that algebra is pretty straightforward. Now, I did some sleight of hand earlier where I said these trig, uh, hyperbolic trig functions have this relationship where you square, uh, in this case, cos h squared minus sine h squared equals one. I said they have that relationship, and then I told you here's their definition. What I didn't do is show you why that definition has that property. So we're gonna check that right now. So we're gonna square them just like we did, except subtract them, and hopefully we'll get one. So we're gonna do something really similar, but we're gonna subtract cos h squared x minus sine h squared x. Hopefully equals one, but we're gonna go see what we get. So really similar to what we just did, except there's a minus in the middle. So all the same stuff, just change this plus that I made super bold into a minus. So I'm going to jump way down to that second step. So we saw that foiling up there. What cancels out when I subtract? Every single e cancels out. So e to the 2x minus e to the 2x, that's gone. e to the minus 2x minus e to the minus 2x. And what survives? 2 fourths minus 2 fourths which is one. So I'll just write it as two fourths minus, wait, two fourths minus negative two fourths. Negative two fourths equals one. All right, so there we go. There's our next identity. So do all that work, we get one. All right, so that definition does have the property cos h squared minus sine h squared uh, equals one. So let's take these, which one? So I'm going to use a combination of the two identities we just wrote down and I could solve the one we just wrote for cos squared, cos h squared equals one plus sine h squared. Cos h squared x equals one plus sine h squared x. And that lets me take out a cos h squared and write it as one plus sine h squared. So I'm going to go and rewrite up here this original identity of the cos h2x of so this double angle. We're going to redo it. So we're going to look at our double angle cos h2x identity. So we're going to begin with cos h2x equals cos h squared x plus sine h squared x, and I'm gonna sub out cos h squared for one plus sine h squared. And that gives us two sine, two sine h squares. And 
And now we're going to solve for sine h squared. So we'll subtract 1. And then divide by 2. So I warned you some point about trigonometry functions and their exponents, the way you write them. Make sure you're squared doesn't look like a 2 coefficient of x. So make sure this exponent of 2 does not look like the coefficient of 2 over here. So you can fix that by making sure your exponent is really small and raised up, or you can explicitly wrap the 2x in parentheses so you know it's okay, 2 it belongs to the x, not the uh, squaring the function. All right, so here's one identity. We're going to do the same trick, except we can replace. We're going to now solve for sine. So we solve for sine squared h up here. We're going to add it to the other side and then subtract 1. So we can write that as, uh-oh. All right, we're back. So we'll subtract sine, subtract 1, and we have, or we can just subtract 1 right off of the line below where I'm writing. So I can substitute out sine squared h, or sine h squared, I should say, and for cos h squared minus 1. So start with the same identity, cos h 2x equals cos h squared x minus sine h squared x, and take out sine squared for cos squared minus 1. So we got cos, wait, something doesn't seem right. It looks like my cosine h's are going to cancel, and I would be left with positive 1. Do you see that algebra step? Cancel, cancel, minus negative 1 is 1. That's not right. That function is not always 1. All right, where do we go wrong? Probably, yep. Plus, plus, now we have 2 cos h squared x is minus 1. Okay. It is, if it was, if you square them and subtract them, you get 1. Okay. If you square them and add them, you get cos h2x. Okay. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> I just didn't want to erase. Two, there we go. And we're going to do the same trick. Solve for cos h squared. We're going to add 1 and divide by 2. So cos h 2x plus 1 over 2 equals cos h squared x. All right, so that's how to turn a sine squared hyperbolic into just cosine hyperbolic and how to turn a cosine squared hyperbolic into regular uh, cosine hyperbolic. So how to unsquare trig functions. Now, how about tangent and cotangent? Probably put these in a box so I can see them quickly when I scroll back up. All right, tangent and cotangent. So some more identities. Tan h squared 
x equals 1 minus seek h squared x and cotangent hyperbolic squared x equals 1 plus cosecant hyperbolic squared x. So again, the normal one was tan squared plus 1 is secant squared. So sort of looks like that, but a little bit different. All right, how can we show this? I could rewrite tangent using that definition, e to the x minus e to the minus x over e to the x plus e to the minus x. Just rewrite. And then uh, on the right side, it'll be common denominator, subtract. Hopefully, they will come out to be the same thing. So I'm going to skip doing these. We've probably done enough algebra. We don't have to prove every single thing. Some things can be because I said so. All right, so we got those two. All right, we are ready for some derivatives. So we haven't done any calculus yet on hyperbolic trig functions. All right, take a wild guess of what the derivative sign would be. Cos h, all right. But not everything is what we want. Might be. So we're going to take derivative. How do we take derivative of this? There's two ways. So I can use the definition of, now there's two definitions. I can use definition of derivative, or I can use definition of what is hyperbolic sign. So let's go with what is definition of hyperbolic sign. That sounds way easier. Uh, if I use the regular definition of derivative, I would need a uh, angle sum formula to break this up. So that would, uh, yeah, we don't need to do that. Uh, I'm not even sure there is one. Uh, I don't know too much about the hyperbolic trig functions other than what we're going through right now. So let's go with the definition of hyperbolic sine. So sine, is that the plus, the minus, e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. All right, this derivative you could definitely do. It's not a tough derivative. In fact, it's one of the ones that is exceptionally easy. e to the x is the best derivative. You don't have to do anything. You have a little chain rule going on, though, so you do have to pay attention to that. So that divided by 2 survives. That's just a constant multiplier. So that survives. So go ahead and take this derivative here. Don't use the quotient rule. That half is just a constant multiplier. So you don't need to go crazy with the quotient rule. So if, if it's difficult to see why the half is a constant multiplier, I just rewrote it, multiply by half. So it should be pretty obvious right there. It's just a multiply by number. So you don't need to worry about that. hyperbolic sine is hyperbolic cosine. So that's nice. So what's next? Cosine. So we're going to do all six trig functions. We have five left to do. Now we do get a free antiderivative for every derivative we get. We don't have to work any harder really to get the antiderivative. So we'll write it right next to this. So the antiderivative of cos hx is sine hx. So 
antiderivative cos h uh, u du is sine h u plus c. So that is our antiderivative. I move the derivative operator to the other side by the inverse derivative, or the antiderivative. All right, so by now you should be used to the pattern of getting a free antiderivative with every derivative. Uh, and not even this, I'm not even going to put a box around this one. So it exists, there may be a homework question or two on it, uh, but I won't, the only thing I'll put on exams and quizzes is the forms we're going to get at the very end, the inverse antiderivatives. All right, so we're going to do cos h now. All right, the only question in your mind is, should it be positive or negative sine h? All right, see if you can find it before I can. You should have gotten positive sine h. And the free antiderivative we get, move the derivative operator to the sine h side, or the, move the operator to the other side with the inverse operator. So antiderivative sine h u du equals cos h u plus c. All right, there's our free antiderivative. All right, next up, tangent. Hyperbolic tangent. All right, any guesses on derivative tangent? Hyperbolic tangent. Well, that's how we're going to get it with the quotient rule. But any guesses on the answer? You're thinking too much. Or you don't know any of your trig derivatives. Secant squared. squared. So most likely hyperbolic secant squared. So we're going to check, see if that is correct. So tangent is sine over cosine. And sine uses the minus, sine uses the minus, e to the x minus e to the minus x over e to the x plus e to the minus x. Now you have quotient rule. So you have to quotient carefully. So go ahead and do that on your own and then check your work. I'll give you a head start if you want to race me. Probably going to be some significant reduction happening here.
not finished? Or did you give up? <laughs> gave up? All right. Now, I did not foil. So what in the world did I do? Hopefully, I did correct stuff. Uh, let's see. So you probably got the quotient rule, right? Right there. So you got the quotient rule. So what did I do after that? I saw that it was the same thing multiplied by itself. So that's squared right there. And the same thing multiplied by itself, so it's minus that thing squared. Now I have difference of squares. So what did I do? Wrote it as conjugate times conjugate. So this is A minus B times B plus, or A plus B. Who foiled? This is audio, they'll never know. <laughs> Did you give up? If you didn't foil, you probably gave up. Are you pleading the fifth? All right. So you could have foiled, and it should have simplified down to four. Either way. So then I saw ah, two times two, two squared, and then squared on the bottom. So that's just two divided by the bottom, whole thing squared, which is reciprocal of cos h, which is secant. And it's all been squared right there. All right, so that was some fun algebra. All of you gave up. OK. So there we go. That was tangent h. Now let's just rewrite this. d dx tan h x equals seek h squared x. All right, we get a free antiderivative, which would be antiderivative seek h squared u du equals tan h u plus c. All right. Tangent. All right, what comes next? Cotangent. How do you do this? Exact same thing, except it will just be the reciprocal of what we had originally. Let's find this derivative a slightly different way. Instead of doing the exact same process we just did with the reciprocal fraction. So I could write it as uh, 1 over tangent tan h x and do a quotient rule. So that's an option. Another option would be write it as tan h x whole thing to the negative first power and then subtract one off the power and all that good stuff. You're not looking like you're enjoying algebra today. This is good algebra practice. All right, so let's go. Let's avoid the quotient rule. Let's write it as a tan hx, whole thing to the negative first. So this is not the inverse trig function. This is the actual reciprocal power. So just be a little careful when you're writing powers next to trig functions that you know which power you're talking about. So this is the reciprocal. So it's negative 1 times tan hx. So that takes care uh, uh, to the negative 2. That's pretty important. Multiplied by the derivative tan hx, which we just said was secant h squared. So seek, seek h squared x. So yeah, negative one uh, secant over tangent. How can we reduce this mess? It's probably not the best form to leave it in. Cotangent. 
So I could write the reciprocal of tangent as a cotangent on the top, so that's an option. What about a multilevel fraction where you have one on the cos and sine over cos and then cos is the So we're going to intentionally turn into a multi-story fraction. So we're going to write in terms of sines and cosines. So secant squared is 1 over cos hyperbolic squared x divided by sine over cos sine hyperbolic squared x over cos hyperbolic squared x. So from here, we're going to multiply by the reciprocal. An alternative you could do, multiply. So you can always multiply by 1. So I'm going to multiply by what would knock out the fraction, the denominator, in the top and the bottom. So I'm going to multiply the numerator by cos squared and the denominator by cos squared. As long as you treat them the same, it's OK. So it basically cancels a cos squared, cos squared. We have negative 1 over cos h squared x, which is negative, yes, 1 over sine h squared. That's pretty important. dealing with the fraction anymore. Uh, that'll be cosecant hyperbolic squared x. All right, there we go. So we avoided any e to the x's. So we basically got some calculus practice instead of more algebra practice. It's important to switch it up. Switch up your workout routine. Keep the mind guessing. All right, so we get a free antiderivative, which we're going to write down. Antiderivative. We're going to move the negative to the other side for this antiderivative. Cosecant hyperbolic squared u du equals negative cotangent hyperbolic u plus c. Next up, derivative of secant. All right, how can we approach secant? So I can write as 1 over cos. I could use the definition of secant. Well, that was pretty much what I wrote as 1 over cos. So, uh, so we'll go with the 1 over cos. 1 over cos hyperbolic x. All right, let's stick with quotient rule this time. We avoided it last time. Let's go with quotient rule. All right, so do the quotient rule yourself. See what you're made of. Are we out of time? Oh, we are out of time. All right. So I'll have to leave you in the middle, mid-derivative. <coughs>